Our last presentation is There is No Success Without a Successor. Dr. John Mark Reynolds is president of the St. Constantine School, a kindergarten through college program. He was provost at HBU and the founder of the Tory Honors Institute at Biola University. He writes a daily column for Patheos and is the author of When Athens Met Jerusalem, an introduction to classical and Christian thought, and the editor of The Great Books Reader. He is a frequent blogger and lecturer on a wide range of topics, including ancient philosophy, classical and home education, politics, faith, and virtue. Dr. Reynolds is married to Hope and has four adult children. He is a member of St. Paul Antiochian Orthodox Church, where he serves on the parish council. John Mark also serves as board chair of OCLI, and it has been a pleasure working with him over the last couple of years. His presentation is dedicated to identifying, cultivating, and making space for organizational successors. And Dr. Reynolds draws on his own wealth of experience in relaying these lessons. Dr. John Mark Reynolds. I once worked at a place uh, that was on the verge of becoming very, very successful. It was becoming uh, one of the more successful uh, colleges or universities of its type. It was attracting young, vibrant, new faculty and leadership, and it had a dynamic and successful president. It's safe to say when the history uh, of the school is written, this particular president will have the largest chapter in the history of that school. The school's about 100 years old. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the president stayed, this is my opinion, in place a few years too long and also left the school with no immediate successor, no succession planning, uh, and a need to hire someone quickly. I, I think that this process uh, caused the school to pass from a place of central growth, of dynamic change, into a place of stagnation. Because by the end of this process, uh, I don't know if you've ever been in an organization, God help us all, I'm closer to this than not myself, where people start wondering if the leader is going to retire every single year. Is this the last year uh, for the leader to be in place? And there's a temptation, of course, for the leader not to announce retirement because then you enter a lame duck mode. Uh, and yet, uh, this is something my dad pounded into me from the time I was a little boy as a pastor and then as a priest. There can't be any success without a successor. Uh, no organization, certainly not a Christian organization, can be built around any person this side of paradise, any human being, because that comes to an end. We, if you require that dynamic person in order to succeed, then ultimately your organization will fail. Now, someone asked me when I talked about this once someplace else, are there organizations that should just end uh, they're built around somebody, but they should just end uh, because they've come to an end. Uh, yes, I think that in the Protestant world, there are several evangelistic organizations that probably should have come to an end with the death of their, you know, dynamic founder, and they didn't, and we can see that the organization founders. Uh, I could imagine inside the church that someone would uh, build an organization to solve a particular problem, and that particular problem gets solved. Uh, there's no reason for that organization to continue uh, or find a new uh, problem to solve necessarily. So it could be uh, that not succeeding is a kind of success, but most of our organizations, for example, schools, churches, we want them to be there for a long period of time. We want to continue to minister. We don't want to have wasted the money uh, that people have invested in the kingdom of God by building something that, let's face it, can end up being a cult of personality. Uh, I'm not saying a priest would ever do this, uh, but maybe it could happen, right? Where a church is so built around the priest's gifts and skills, and so little has been done to cultivate lay leadership, that if a different sort of priest comes in, the church goes into decline. Let me touch quickly on a couple of the principles that I mentioned uh, inside my talk. And uh, the other thing I want to say is the looking for a successor is a natural part of being a leader because mentoring people, if you are a leader, should be part of something you do every day. So the search for a successor in some ways uh, is accidental if you're mentoring a lot of people inside your organization, inside your parish, and this includes a parish council president is the parish council president constantly 
looking for a young adult uh, or a teen and, and sees talent, sees leadership potential in that person and brings them on as a shadow leader, as someone who can see what it is to be a parish council president, particularly someone who doesn't look like they look or has a different skill set. If we're constantly mentoring people, then um, succession planning sometimes takes care of itself. So this is a necessary thing. And particularly though, if you step back and look at a parish or you look at a nonprofit, so we're talking about nonprofits, the more critical a leader is to the nonprofit, particularly a founding leader, the more important it is that it be done immediately. Uh, to pick a really extreme example, uh, I don't know how long I'm going to live. I don't know what could happen to me. So if I haven't thought through immediately, uh, who, what are some strong leaders in the St. Constantine School? If I became incapacitated tomorrow, God forbid, uh, what would happen to the school? Uh, if I'm necessary to the health of the school in some super strong sense, then I haven't done a good job as a leader. Uh, I'm older, so maybe that becomes more important. But I can tell you this, uh, with mentoring, uh, the people who mentored me as a leader, when I was a leader, I started the Tory Honors Institute, the Honors College at Biola, right around the time I was 30, and immediately began to plan to leave. Because plainly, as a founder, they have too much of my DNA inside the Honors College at Biola University, no matter what happens. And so uh, eventually, uh, it was about 15 years, I should step out of that role and allow people that have come up along uh, to take the organization to the next level. Uh, the more I can do that, while well, I'm still uh, able to step aside and be a reference, uh, be a resource for the organization, uh, if they need it, the better off it will be. So succession planning is something that has to be done immediately, particularly if the person seems indispensable. Here's the really good news. Nobody is indispensable. But you can think of leaders, one thinks in the business world and in the creative world about Walt Disney, who was working on the Disney World project. He was so invested in it that even though he was pretty obviously seriously ill, uh, he didn't plan for succession inside his own organization. So for a long period of time, the Disney organization sort of wandered around asking what Walt would do. And of course, it got to be the 70s, and eventually what Walt would have done was not ask what Walt would do, because Walt died in the late 60s. Uh, and so this failure of what was otherwise a very creative, dynamic leader to plan on what would happen in the era after his own life, when it was pretty obvious that era was coming soon, uh, is, is simply a failure, a very important failure that we need to avoid. Uh, the other thing to point out is that no dynamic leader of a nonprofit or uh, obviously of a parish, since bishops uh, pick uh, parish priests, we're now talking about the lay leadership inside the parish, uh, can know for sure who their successor should be or what skill set will be necessary. So the other thing I talked about in, uh, in the lecture uh, that you could take a look at is hiring and mentoring multiple successors with different skill sets people that you talk to and say, uh, this is a job, I have a job, president of the St. Constantine School, you're the kind of person that should as aspire to this kind of job. And that will often be a 22, 23 year old new employee. And you begin to talk to them about what would it take? What are your particular gifts? Do you have any interest in that kind of leadership? So that you leave a board or you leave uh, who, whatever priest comes with lots of choices for a parish council president, with lots of different skill sets, with lots of different giftings, uh, because you're just constantly looking around saying, uh, who can I elevate? Uh, who, how can I decrease? How can I go into a John the Baptist role uh, decreasing, waning while somebody else is waxing inside of my organization? And if you're constantly doing that with lots of different people, uh, I think you'll see uh, amazing success inside your organization. Uh, now, someone always asks me at this point, man, if you make everybody, uh, many people ambitious for your own job, uh, how do you stop infighting? Uh, obviously, I, don't, I hope not to retire for about 13 more years. 
uh, that we'll talk, we can talk in the questions. I have a date certain for my own retirement. Uh, if God lets me go that long and our board lets me go that long so that uh, I don't end up in the same position of someone who lingers and lingers because people kind of like you and they let you stay until you've worn out your welcome. Uh, and that is uh, when I get calls from headhunters at St. Constantine, either in the college side or the uh, K through 12 side, I promote my own people out of the organization. And there are far too many people that try to hide talent. Look, if you're starting a K through 12 school, you should uh, try to hire uh, Kate Gilbert, who is our head of school uh, for the St. Constantine School. And if she needs to leave to be promoted, she needs a bigger venue, a place to go, then that's what I should do to help her grow. Uh, eventually, of course, if you do this long enough, and we did this in Tory Honors, you end up with many, many, many people uh, who are uh, able to come back to your school and assume leadership, but also allies in external places. Uh, this is a, a very uh, wonderful thing that can cause growth. So if you're in an organization, a nonprofit, uh, or even working with a parish council, never be afraid to say, uh, maybe you could go over to this church over here and help that church if you're a parish priest. You're, we've got a lot of strong leaders in our church because we've inculcated strong leadership. Uh, why don't you uh, go help someone else? Because this bread cast on the water in my experience and looking at the experiences of others always comes back to bless you. And it, even if it doesn't, it blesses the broader church, uh, the broader nonprofit community. Uh, the next principle I tried to point to is that you are replacing, not replicating the person. The next director of the Tory Honors Institute does not have my personality, thank God for him, uh, at all. He's a different sort of leader. Uh, in some ways, I'm a starter and uh, I help bring an organization through to a mature state. Uh, and then it's been my career, I think I've only had one job that someone had before me, uh, to move on and start and bring to maturity uh, the next organization uh, to get it to a stable place. Now, given my age, uh, this is my last go round. So I hope God gives me uh, the grace to get the St. Constantine School and the college on this kind of you know, 15, 16 year a stable plan. But after all, after 15 years, and probably a lot shorter if you're on the cabinet, pity Emily Kasarabze, who has to hear me talk all the time. Uh, they've heard all my stories, they've heard all my jokes, and they've heard them to the point that, like with my grandfather, got to the point where I could tell my grandfather's stories better than he could. And that's about the time uh, when a leader should move on. But move on in a way where uh, there are many different options for the organization because, again, projecting what the world will look like in 13 years is impossible. What skill set will St. Constantine uh, need in the future? Uh, projecting forward even five, six months is difficult. Uh, in February, we had our gala. What a great time. Things were really in good order. By March, uh, the governor of Texas had locked down our school and we were doing class online. Now, we had been monitoring that situation since December, roughly, and had plans in place, but uh, we never, till the very end, the future was unpredictable and how people in our community would respond to that. Uh, that was an unpredictable thing. And so it turned out some of our leaders that had been developed had just the right skill set for pandemic time. Uh, so even though we couldn't a year ago have anticipated needing sort of that online leadership, those leaders were able to step up and come to the forefront. Some of them from our part-time community where there had been some mentoring by me and by our leadership team for these, with these part-time people who then stepped into full-time roles. The other uh, problem that you see a lot in nonprofits, and this has come up in nonprofit university education just recently, uh, is what do you do with talented family members? Uh, just because someone's in a family doesn't mean they should never get a job inside the organization. Simultaneously, we've seen uh, too often in nonprofits, the Holy Spirit simply calls a member of one family to lead that organization in some kind of uh, miracle. Uh, how can it always be that someone from this family is called to run this nonprofit or this organization or even this family business? Uh, skill sets aren't always genetic. 
uh, they don't always pass down the line. So how do you wobble along? I think generally speaking, uh, someone should leave an organization or even a parish, go be tested somewhere else, manifest that kind of leadership, uh, show the skills needed, and they can then be brought back uh, if necessary. So you don't want to avoid uh, a highly skilled and gifted family in your parish or your nonprofit, but simultaneously, uh, you don't want to just fall into the habit of looking uh, to what can turn into a bad form of nepotism inside an organization. Having policies at the board level uh, where conflicts of interest or nepotistic hires have to be thought about by a broader board or an outside community is always important, I think, uh, when you're looking at succession planning. Uh, because your last name is Reynolds doesn't mean that you should be president of St. Constantine. But I would hope, you know, if one of my children decided to do that and had the right skill set, they wouldn't be automatically eliminated uh, from that process either. Uh, fundamentally, it's mission critical to know the DNA of the nonprofit, of the place you're working for. What are you really? So a core thing in our cabinet is to constantly talk about the principles that we will not not do. Uh, what would be the worst? Well, one deep principle for us is everyone who administrates also teaches. And so we would not want to bring in a potential successor or start working with or mentoring a potential leader who thought, no, we should have full-time administrators. Administrators should run things and not teachers. Uh, and so uh, we still uh, want to know who are we and what is not up for grabs. You know, the organization, if it changed in that way in the successor, uh, would change who it is entirely. Uh, and so finally, I'll just say, try to plan your exit. Uh, try to talk to someone. I realize with bishops and things, one does not always control one's exit. Uh, but try to plan your exit if you can and hand over the keys in good order instead of waiting till the last conceivable minute and leaving your successor in a bad place. And this is so important, particularly for people in the middle of their career uh, or towards the beginning of their career because habitually staying in a place can seem like the right thing to do and leaving and uh, moving around can be bad. Uh, so let me take questions. If they're there, somebody can read them to me. It would help my aging eyes uh, a good bit if we have a volunteer. We have a lot yes. of here about um, term limits for the Orthodox priesthood. Um, a few I, I am going to resolutely have no opinion about that. Uh, Father Chad, for example, uh, I'm neither a priest, nor do I play one on TV, nor am I a bishop, uh, and so I shall not comment on that. Uh, I do think I can make a general comment. Uh, priests have a different kind of leadership than the kind of nonprofit leader I was discussing in many ways, and I'm not even fit, probably, to comment on that uh, difference. And yet, uh, a priest can constantly think about uh, mortality, and the fact that nobody li lives forever, and have they left behind a strong parish uh, if the bishop were to call them somewhere else, if they were to pass away? Uh, does the parish need them in a sort of dysfunctional sense? Uh, let me not comment, comment on any Orthodox parish, and let me simply say that uh, my dad pastored pastors and priests in another circumstance, in a different, he's now Orthodox, he joined uh, the Orthodox Church, and it's wonderful. At 83, he still gives me advice all the time and mentors me. Uh, but when he was pastoring pastors in a different, uh, more Anglican religious uh, context, uh, he saw again and again that too many priests had built everything around their personality and their skill sets. And so when they were called somewhere else or when they passed away, uh, the parish wasn't strong enough to take a different skill set that came from a different kind of priest. So, you know, whether there should be term limits or whatever should be done, uh, I assume, Father Chad, you wouldn't disagree that a priest shouldn't build the entire nonprofit around his personality. Well, absolutely. Um, and sometimes there are successful parishes that are, I classify as Father Knows Best parishes, uh, but they almost always collapse after that person because it's built around his persona. Yes, I, the other thing I want to say is, uh, having run, you know, uh, three or four pretty large organizations, 
uh, in an academic community, I have never seen anything but benefit from hiring people who are smarter than I am, uh, who are better at, at everything. I, I once had a manager, actually. Uh, I gave a talk, and I was never allowed to speak again inside the organization. Uh, I think it was probably because my speaking uh, was challenging to this particular person's position in their mind. I, on the other hand, uh, have hired many people who are better speakers than I am, many people who are better writers uh, and communicators, and do everything I can uh, to step back from people like Megan Muller. And this process begins very early. We have a person, Megan Muller, uh, who came as a freshman into the Honors College program, uh, spotted her as a genuine leader. She began to work inside the Tory Honors office, took on more and more responsibility. By the time she graduated, she was running the Tory Europe trips, uh, the student-run trips where I went and, and we would do uh, community education. We brought her out to Houston when I was the provost of HBU, put her in a different organizational structure, not under me at all, uh, where an outside advisor came in and said, this is a real star. And now, of course, she handles marketing and communications, kind of the face, the aesthetic uh, decision maker inside of St. Constantine. So this is a process that began when Megan was 18, uh, moved outside of uh, direct mentoring and, and showed growth. Yes, I'm sorry, Holly, have I gone over? No, 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 there's another question. Um, what are the five yes. negotiable skills uh -huh. and talents that you look for or see? Who do you, who, who you think would make the most ideal successor? Are there non-negotiables for that? Are there non-negotiables? Yeah, that's a, a great question. The first thing I do is to look for people who look nothing like I look, uh, because I think there is such a temptation to replicate oneself and to think of oneself as uh, better than they are that I try to uh, start with, uh, what are some skills I plainly don't have? Uh, what are things the organization needs that I don't have? And then I, and, and even my physical appearance, even the way I am, and who are some people uh, that have those different skills? But I'd start uh, with five things. Uh, the first thing is uh, I don't find a person uh, who's a narcissist, who has to be in front, uh, who has to be, uh, I'm using this informally, not in a psychological sense, uh, who has to be the center of everything. I uh, find a person. Uh, I will look around and see who's picking up chairs in an after school event or who is doing volunteer work. And then I will just highlight them in my mind because they're willing to do unpaid and volunteer work. That's a non-negotiable uh, inside organizations that I've been in. Uh, the current director of the Tory Honors Institute was an, a graduate student who was taking a class with me and just started hanging out and doing office work. He would literally answer the phones. He would bring in treats for the office when we had very few employees. Uh, he went from emptying the trash can to being director of the largest honors program of its sort uh, because he was a servant leader. So that's a non-negotiable. And if you start early enough, you can see it in what people do. Uh, the second thing that's a non-negotiable is that they adopt the DNA of the organization without being having it pounded into them. Gosh, if I want to be president of St. Constantine School, I better become Orthodox. Let me quickly go convert is the very sort of person you don't want to hire. Uh, so you're looking for somebody that immediately shares the DNA of the organization, embraces the things that are central to what you're doing. Uh, if someone uh, develops ethical positions, we're very strong on tr uh, the teachings, the ethical teachings of the church. Uh, I'm don't want to shock anyone, but sometimes people will adopt positions simply so they can get jobs they want. Uh, and so you're looking for someone who organically uh, shares uh, the basic principles. Uh, the third thing I would say is that you're looking for uh, someone who likes people. Uh, I once interviewed a potential librarian and the potential librarian, uh, I gave them the first softball, which was, what's your favorite book? And the librarian said, oh, I really don't like books. I don't like to read. Um, it turned out the librarian liked organizing books. And I kind of get that, organizing media. But I, I don't know about you, but I just it somehow seemed like she ought to like to read to be a librarian. So I didn't 
it didn't hire that person. In the same way, if you're going to lead a team of people, it strikes me as a non-negotiable that you should like people. Now, I, every organization needs what uh, C.S. Lewis described in That Hideous Strength as a McPhee. Uh, I always hire one, the local curmudgeon critic, uh, who sort of hates everything that you're doing and kind of pokes the balloon. But that person can't be the leader, and you're not mentoring them for leadership because they don't like people. Uh, and so the final two things that I would say that I look for uh, in a leader, and I didn't know I was going to get a list of five, so if these are repetitive or foolish, uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, the fourth thing that I would look for in a leader is an ability to communicate in some media or another. Uh, in the world that we live in, it's very difficult to lead if you can't communicate. You, you don't have to be the best communicator in your organization. I'm surely not uh, the best writer or anything else. But you have to be able to communicate effectively uh, to be somewhat interesting to get across the ideas you want to do. So I often look for people uh, that people listen to when they're standing in a group. So I had a faculty party uh, last night. Uh, we have a new coach who came in. Everyone was standing around him listening uh, to what he had to say. Uh, that could be a sign of a good future leader because they were interesting. People wanted to hear uh, what this young man had to say about the world. And then finally, uh, my dad would say this. Uh, I asked my dad once what the most important uh, virtue that he looked for in a leader inside the church. And he said, well, you have to take character for granted. Don't, don't hire an evil person. So, okay, I, I, I've got that. Uh, don't hire an evil person. That's a free one. Uh, but he said this, loyalty. He said the hardest thing to find in an organization is loyalty, uh, virtuous loyalty. The loyal person will tell you what's wrong inside your organization. They'll tell you what's wrong with you. Uh, they won't hide bad things that shouldn't be hidden. But simultaneously, they're loyal to the cause uh, that everyone's united around. Uh, they're not waiting to shiv you to get your job. They're not waiting to shiv their colleagues, you know, to stab their colleagues in the back to get a job. Uh, after about 40 years uh, inside of organizations, my dad said the hardest thing to find in aspiring leaders is the ability to be loyal to your mentors and to the people above you. So I also look for people that you can trust uh, not to advance their own career at the cost of the organization. Not of me, that, that's not so important. Uh, they have a loyalty to the mission and vision of what's going on. John and Mark, uh, I have a question and, and comment from a couple of the priests. Uh, oh, please. The uh, in a predecessor to having a successor may be that someone needs to leave, a layperson on the church yes. path uh, yes. and ask the question specifically, how can you best help someone, such a lay person, gracefully exit a position when change is necessary, especially if the skill set is no longer relevant and technology and advanced abilities are required. And I might add, and who's been a long standing parishioner and uh, may need the salary. Yes, I've had to uh, do this lots in my career, as you can imagine. The other thing I got a question about that I hope I addressed a little is what if a person thinks they should have your job, but pretty clearly no one else agrees with that and they don't have the right skill set, but they're awesomely valuable to the community. First of all, this rarely goes well. Uh, somebody has to be saintly uh, to handle this, but part of mentoring and being a good leader Part of uh, finding good succession is having the hard conversation with somebody you love and either letting them go or giving them the opportunity to be saintly, to be virtuous and candidly saying, uh, for example, you don't have your fastball anymore. Uh, we need a different skill set in this position. We deeply value what you're doing. Uh, we're going to be as generous with you as, as we can but we can't go forward in this way. I'd like to tell you that those kinds of candid conversations always go well. They go much better if you have years of mentoring uh, and talking to the person candidly. You don't wait to tell them about their problem two minutes before you let them go. 
if you've had candid conversations with people, uh, if you are constantly reviewing your team's skill sets, then this won't be as devastating. But I have to tell you, uh, it's easy to deliver good news. People receive it really well. I might have the potential to lead this organization. What they don't receive well is eventually you come and say, I think inside this organization, you've gone as far as you can go. Uh, I, we've talked and we've looked at this and the community sort of sees this is where you need to be. You're doing a great job here. Uh, you're unlikely to go further inside the organization. Um, generally, then I try to help them find a role in another organization if they want to leave while I candidly talk about my opinions. Uh, but this, this is very difficult. And uh, if people aren't virtuous, it doesn't go well, but it's necessary to the organization. Uh, I worked for one boss who was very good, who said this, often who you let go or remove from a position is the equivalent of adding two people because you've removed an impediment to the organization and simultaneously opened up uh, a position for the new blood or, you know, it's not age thing. Uh, it could be an older person uh, who has been choked off from that kind of job. So Charles, there's no good way to do it. Uh, I have to say about half the time people receive this well and about half the time they're angry. And this is where if you have a, okay, uh, what if you go here and let me help you find a new place to be? Thanks. Thanks. Good news is easy to deliver. Bad news is very hard to deliver. But standing relationships and sincerity. The other thing is I try to not judge this by myself. So if I were going to have this kind of conversation, I would have talked to many, many leaders inside the team uh, who all spontaneously say, yeah, this, this, this person needs to go. They're done. Uh, boy, I wouldn't tell someone that just based on my own, you know. Both your advisors, both your advisors regard are good and have been followed. I have a, a separate point, which is in addition to you talking about a new person coming in, bringing fresh, now talking about the leader of a, of a non-church, a, a non-profit uh, or education. Right institution. Uh, Nonprofits have a cycle, those who study this thing carefully, and you reach an apex. And if you aren't doing new things or adjusting to the environment, you then start on a decline curve. And uh, so it becomes very important that either existing leaders are able to be flexible enough to adjust to new circumstances, but even more so, it emphasizes that there's a role for founders and there's a role for people bringing things to the to the next step. As you know, with OCLI, the founder resigned even before going on the board. Yes, yes. Uh, I always like to, to honor people as much as possible. Uh, no one ever gave out too many plaques, I would, I would guess. And if somebody has done something good for the organization, honoring that, and I mean this in, in, in a sincere way, not in a false way, honoring that, honoring our fathers and mothers, helping people to retire gracefully is really important. But I want to underline something. A nonprofit or a church organization is not a form of social welfare. Uh, whatever one thinks about American forms of social welfare for older people or for people near retirement, uh, a person cannot be kept in a make work position, causing the nonprofit to go under simply because we're afraid the person needs the money. Uh, it would be far better for the church to have a fundraiser privately to do anything uh, than to keep a person in a position, for example, a teacher or a professor, uh, simply because we're afraid that they would run into a financial problem that you can't solve a financial problem by causing someone to humiliate themselves and to humiliate the organization because you want to give them money. I, uh, you can't, that's just not the right way to solve a problem. And, and that's not being cruel. Uh, maybe the organization should do something, but it's not letting a person do something they don't do well till everyone forgets the good they did because of the last four or five years of their bad performance. That, that's cruel. That's just cruel. And I've seen it happen in church contexts uh, so many times as a pastor's kid, uh, where a secretary was allowed to 
uh, become crabby. Uh, they had a personality change uh, and it wasn't their fault and they were just kept in the position. Uh, it's almost the case that the parish should have paid them a retirement fund uh, and moved them out of the position if they could afford to. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. 